Welcome to For the Record, I'm Betty Lou. Former General Electric CEO Jack Welch is known as one of the world's best managers. And in the years since GE, he has brought his no-nonsense, straight-from-the-gut management style to students all over the globe. Finally, he and his wife Susie have decided teaching is not enough. The two are now launching an online MBA program that is distinctly Jack Welch. The Welches have bought a stake in Ohio's Chancellor University and are ready to launch the Jack Welch Management Institute. They sat down with me here at Le Cirque, the plush New York restaurant just across from their home in Midtown Manhattan, to talk about why business education has to be rethought and retooled. I've been following online education for about five years with an entrepreneur who's been pushing me to get involved. And as I started to see it, I saw the reach it had and the way it can change lives. I mean, we can touch people who can keep working, the veterans coming home, all kinds of audiences can participate and still earn money in their job. I mean, I think that uh, just looking at it from a perspective of a person who sort of studied Jack, knows Jack, writes about Jack, writes <laughs> Jack's thoughts, um, Jack is fundamentally an educator. Here was this opportunity for Jack to take this teaching that he does in every way, teaching at MIT and teaching with our courses and our books and so forth, and actually ex extend the reach of it. So I think it actually fulfills truly who he is. Well, some might say, because 10 years ago, I think Fortune magazine had called you the manager of the century. And some might say, why did it take you so long to do this? Yeah. I mean, you should have done this years ago. Online had to get it out of blood. Uh, and I think it's now there, but at first, it, Online has a certain taint to it, and we're, we're, we're going to erase that taint, that taint by putting in the highest quality MBA program out there. How? This is not going to be an MBA mill. Hmm. This is going to be a quality education with quality curriculum with outstanding faculty from the best business schools in the country. But Jack, you're a numbers guy. Give me some numbers on this university. I mean, what are you expecting in terms of enrollment? Uh, it's a for-profit. What are you expecting? In we'll start out in our, in our first year, we're hoping, for 500 to 1,000 students, and, and hopefully to move it up to 5, 10, 15, 25,000 students around the world. You know, look, we're really inventing something, right? It, it, this has not been done before, a, a branded MBA for-profit, so we have these resources to bring on great people. This model a high quality online education with a strong philosophy embedded in a traditional MBA. That's not been done before, so we are going to learn as we go. You know, obviously, though, you're launching this at a time, though, when people are very worried about their jobs, they're worried about how they're going to pay their bills. And education, in many ways, is, uh, I want to say higher education, sometimes um, can take a back seat if you're not, if you're already working in the workforce, how are you going to pay for an MBA, essentially? This is the best time. If you look now at people, they're uncertain about their future, they know they need more, more education. Online's up 28% this year, in the middle of a recession. Online education is booming because people are seeing it's a way to upgrade themselves, get themselves better positioned in the workforce. Without taking the risk of leaving their jobs. Hmm. Mm. All right, well, tell me what do you think is wrong with MBA schools as they stand? There's a lot of things right about, the, about MBAs. I mean, I think that um, we're not in the camp that sort of says everything is wrong with, online, uh, with MBA education online and off. But there is one problem that we can overcome online, and that is that in most MBA programs, it's, there are uh, two things missing. One is that it's not global enough in the thinking, and we will have a very global aspect, to, first of all, to our students, mm -hmm. but also to our philosophy. And the other is that there's silos between marketing and finance and strategy, and that is not the way business is done. Jack's whole philosophy is based on boundarylessness between functions, and we're going to definitely make that part of the program. And we are not anti-MBAs. We like MBAs. We hire MBAs. We, we, we just think we can enrich the MBA experience. What do you think, though, that the MBA schools now have a responsibility to teach after this crisis? Well, they clearly have to get a deep discussion of ethics, compensation, what caused the issue. I, I taught a course the, this year at MIT where we threw out the syllabus and we said, we're, we're going to teach business today. So week one, we were talking about the top, debating the top. Week, week two, the bail, bail out of the automotive company. How could an MBA of, of faculty teach the same course in the fall and spring of 08 and 09 that they taught in 06 and 07? And too many of them were. Well, with an online school, we, we can adapt to the times, teach the curriculum, but bring today's business 
every week in this course, I'm going to, in this uh, school, I'm, I'm going to be online video talking about the week's events. Here's what happened this week. Let's debate it. I mean, that is what the technology enables. I mean, here is an opportunity because of the new technology for Jack to speak directly to the students of the Jack Welch Management Institute every week about very current events and then have, you know, people writing in, on, you know, online debating it with each other. So a student in Romania could be debating, you know, what's going on in the EU with a student in Japan, uh, you know, facilitated by Jack's comments. And that is a unique experience. We just don't know any other place where that is. Are you going to be, uh, let's say, how do I say it? infusing any GE management techniques in well, the courses? I would say it'll be the philosophy I believe in. I've written about in, in two books, three books. Uh, it's the philosophy that we write about every week. And uh, it is clear and concise. Now, it's one way of managing, but that'll be overlaid on top of the traditional way. So a student will be able to debate with what's in a textbook of a professor with this method, and they can take the best of both. Up next, from teaching to tweeting, how the Welches became one of the vanguards of online communication. And ridiculous, ridiculous, absolutely political grandstanding. What's got Jack so steamy? Jack and Susie Welch not only teach, they tweet. And they also, among other things, host a business show on MSN, go on book tours, and write a column for Business Week magazine. In other words, they're two very busy communicators who jumped on the latest internet fad because they say it makes them better at what they do. It's a kick. It, yeah. it, it is a kick to be able to get up in the, mor the, the morning, have some thoughts, put them out, uh, out there, and watch people respond to your ideas. And you have hundreds of thousands of people responding to a thought. Let's take last, last, last weekend. Last weekend, we were getting, getting ready to do our column. We had a whole raft of questions from Business Week to answer. We said, let's see what's, what, what's, what's on everyone's mind out there. So we wrote, we, we've got our column tomorrow. We've got to write it Sunday. Give us some questions. Hmm. Several hundred questions came in instantly. Right. They were fantastic. We used one. It was about President Obama. Is he going too fast? Mm -hmm. and, we, that, and we took that, and that was not from one person, that was from several. Right. So, so we've got a communication. You, you, we, we test ideas out there, and you get a real feel for what's happening. I love it. Yeah, I think that we must be, uh, for, we like to have fun, obviously, as sort of like something that drives us, and I think we're sort of uh, connection junkies. I mean, we like connecting <laughs> with people. When we're on the book tour, you know, we'll talk with every single person on the line. It's just our personality. We have right. similar personalities, and so tweeting, just <laughs> tweeting is sort of made for us. In fact, when I think first learned about Twitter, I said to Jack, I did it a few weeks before Jack started it, and I said, oh my God, this is made for you. It's a problem. When they institutionalize us, I just hope they put us in the same cell. I mean, I knew where we were going, and it's worked out great. We love it. <laughs> this morning, I tweeted about David Ortiz, the Red Sox designated hitter. He had a, he had a home run last night. He's had several home runs in the last week after not hitting at all today. And I said, it looks like David is hitting the ball. It's fun. That's the bottom line with tweeting. It's fun. I went to Barney Frank last night, David, David, David Ortiz this morning. And what did you talk to Barney Frank about? Well, I didn't talk to him. You tweeted about, oh, you yeah, tweeted tweeted about, about Barney Frank. Well, he's pushing now for, for lightening up the standards on condominiums for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Hasn't he caused enough trouble? He, you know, he went out and did that uh, before in, in the housing crisis. Well, and that brings up an interesting point because actually, Jack, you know, you had you had at one point tweeted, I think, about uh, the New York Times, the discussions, the labor discussions with the Boston yeah. Globe, and that generated some news reports. I mean, do you ever think to yourself before you tweet, oh, gee, you know, this is me, Jack Welsh, talking about this. People are going to pick up on it, and I might have to censor myself in that sense. No, 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 no. no it's what I believe. Why would I censor my, myself? If somebody wants to grab it, it's what I think. I've always been open and candid. That's it, if, if, and, I, and I, I'm not worried about am I saying something that's going to... Right. So no business person should do without one, you think? Oh. No, I don't know. It's a personality um, thing, it, yeah. It's, and if you're running a company, I think you've got to be a lot more careful probably than you do if you're a citizen mm. out there to... You know, I'm not sure every CEO should be doing this. I, I don't know enough about it yet. And it's fun? You think it'll make money? That's the question. I mean, uh, you know, it I could, hope it does. It, but I, I think, maybe it's really important for us to get a sense.
with these, with, with these you know, we, we've got armies out there trying ideas out. Yeah. And some aren't so good, and we get feedback on it. You always want to have voice coming at you to test your ideas. It's a, it's a great medium in my view. I think it's exciting. What are most viewers and readers, what are they, in this day and age, I mean, what are they most concerned about? I would say right now uh, it's jobs, it's bosses, it's, uh, and from the political side it is uh, uh, the pace of change, whether the pace of change is right or wrong, are we doing too much, aren't we doing it, and we have to do it, you know, you get both sides of that argument. Uh, people are demoralized. That's what I noticed when I was looking over all of our questions the other day. I was just trying to get my arms around what the trends were. A lot of questions about Iran, but separate from that, people saying, um, my team is demoralized. How do I motivate them? Or I am demoralized. How can I get my mojo going? Because I am afraid um, if I lose my energy, I will be one of the people to let be let go. So mm -hmm. there is fear and concern, but uh, exhaustion with the recession, exhaustion. Yeah. How does that fear turn to optimism? Jack Welch answers that. Plus, find out the hot button issue that's got the Welches up in arms. Stay tuned. Welcome back to For the Record. I'm Betty Lou. Jack Welch is an optimist when it comes to how the U.S. economy will fare in the long run. But add in President Obama's budget plans and the Welches paint a worrying picture. One that's got them convinced the president is leading the country down the wrong economic path. While the U.S. economy is not falling as much as it was just a few months ago. We have not seen an uptick. There is no question that we are sort of bumping along. This economy has got a lot of way to go before we get out of this. I mean, we're, going to de we're deleveraging. When you deleverage a society with that much debt and people start saving and governments start saving, it's going to take some time. We're out of the crisis mode. I've been quoted several times as saying Ben Bernanke, Hank Paulson, and Guyana, they're national heroes for what they did last fall when the thing was close to breaking up. I mean, I don't, we were close to the end of the ball game. And uh, they They're being it. raked over the coals right now, though. Oh, for what? I know. Ridiculous. Yeah. Ridiculous. Absolutely political grandstanding. They, they did a fantastic job. Societies do this. I think, you know, one thing we cannot question is Ben Bernanke's motives. He's a great American who loves America. What would be his motivation except for to save the system from destruction? Uh, he was a person who was looking at the entire ship going to the bottom of the sea. And so if he did what he's accused of, his motives were so noble. So why are, I mean, to, to be crucifying him now seems um, uh, just... Uh, so, political. Well, given that then, and of course, there's a lot of debate about whether or not he should go another term um, when his term is up in January. Do you feel, and I'm going to ask it this way, do you feel that he deserves to get another term? Absolutely. One hundred percent. Yep. Let me ask you also about, um, about the no visibility panel that you both were at here at Bloomberg. His plan <laughs> for the next five years can't happen. But my big takeaway from that panel was that uh, the war is not over. The economic crisis, the war against the economic crisis is not over. Um, when do you think it will be? I mean, not even when, but how is it going to be over? It's going to be over when confidence is gradually brought back into the system. Uh, we, we, we've got two, two things happening here. Uh, unemployment is a lagging indicator normally. But... In a case like this, where you have such massive unemployment in such a short time, what is it, 14 months, you don't get buying power very quickly after that. People have changed habits. People are not spending the way they spent before. People are, are, have been shocked. So the recovery will have to be slower. Well, then does that mean, though, that us Americans have to adjust to a lower level of growth then for a long term? You have hit our hot button. The president's plan, forecast of 4% growth is a 3, 8.8 is not doable. We didn't do it in the 70s. We didn't do it in the 80s. We didn't do it in the, in the, in the 90s. So he has a top line afternoon, that is larger than uh, uh, he's going to get. So when you have a top line that's high, you can stuff in more programs, mm -hmm. and the deficit doesn't look as bad. If the top line falls, if we only grow at 2%, we will not have the deficit he's forecasting. We'll have two or three times that deficit. Right, and you can put that on paper, but obviously, as that pans out, that something will give. Something will give. It, it's not realistic. Give. Well, it's so, like so what's going to give? It's like, it's like in a company. When, when a leader in a company wants to stuff a, a, 
a year with all kinds of programs. Puts in a big sales number. Then he puts in the programs. Then the end, end of the year, year comes, and the bottom line is terrible because he didn't get the top line. So something has to give next year. Taxes. You, 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 you can't have those programs. Look, we're in for a tax. huge tax increase. We're in for a On the corporate and on the personal oh, income front. Everyone, and everyone's going to be touched. If it's tax crossing the street. I mean, there's only one way to close that gap, and it's going to be taxes. They're not going to take out the programs they've just put in. Coming up, has a legacy of Jack Welch forced Wall Street to focus too much on short-term targets? The legendary CEO defends his 20-year record of meeting the street. Plus, sage advice from the Welches that any MBA student should hear. It's often said that Jack Welch's legacy of never missing short-term targets for 20 years has become a source of pride and a burden for CEOs. Should chief executives be so focused on short-term goals? And how else can they communicate their success? In a time like this, the leaders have to communicate like they've never communicated before. Employees have to know with trans clear transparency what's happening. Employees have to feel the economy and, and, and feel why we're doing things and what's in it for them all the time. It isn't a once a month communication. It's constant. Well, I want to ask you also, um, at the panel, the moderator, as he was asking you, uh, you know, Jack, you had legendary 20 years at GE, always met your short-term targets. Yeah. But in this crisis, though, companies failing to meet those targets and seeing their stocks go down because of that. In retrospect, do you think that was a good thing or a bad thing? What, meeting short-term targets? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I you mean, set I... the standard, essentially. If you want to look at 20% growth over 20 years, that's a long term in my view. Now, we, I always have a belief, you eat while you dream. And eating is delivering in the short term. Dreaming is being delivering in the long term. You have to do both. Any jerk can sit there and say, we're going we're, we're, we're to make the next quarter. We're going to squeeze everything out. Or anybody can say, come back and see me in five years. No, you got to do both. That's leadership. I mean, it's the essence of leadership. It's the balancing of those two. You're setting your targets. The analysts don't set your targets. Why the hell wouldn't I meet my, my, my target when I'm telling them what it is? But do you at least entertain other ideas on how you can benchmark a performance of a CEO besides meeting, let's say, EPS targets or revenue targets? I mean, there's three major measures. Uh, are, you, are, you making cash, are you delivering cash? Are, you, uh, are your employees engaged, really engaged in the, in the mission? Are they feeling good about you and the direction? And do your customers love your products? You get those things right, and is yeah. your service good? You'll come out pretty good in the long term. Pretty much everything follows that. What would you say to an MBA grad right now who's going on into the wide world where bankers are vilified, Wall Street is hemmed in by regulation, and Washington is a lender of last resort? What do you say to that person? I say America is the greatest place in the world for growth and opportunity. I think the, mo the more education you can get, the better off you will be. The days of sort of graduating and, uh, and uh, you know, like having the big expense account and, and sort of having that TV version of what it is to be business, those, that's over. But that's okay because paying your dues is incredibly fun. Business kids coming out of school or coming to our institute to get an MBA have to be proud of this noble profession they're entering. It's a noble work. And government doesn't create anything. We give them the money from the efforts that we put in, and then they guide the system with laws, with re re regulations, with foreign policy. But it all comes from a healthy economy. Without a healthy economy, you have nothing. Words of wisdom from two who want to infuse hope and idealism back into the world of business. Whether it be launching an online MBA program or waxing on about the future of the US economy, as Jack often says, the game isn't over, it's just beginning again. For the record, I'm Betty Lou. Thanks for watching.